What's up, people? Welcome back to another NFL Deep Dives episode. Today we have the 25th team in my power rankings, and it's a bit of a surprise in the Detroit Lions. I say surprise because most of the big media pools have this team around 12 or 13th, and I have it about half of that. This is a team that was in a ton of close games last season and a team that really won over the media. For me, that's very dangerous as those are major signs for regression in the following season. To back that up, 13 out of their 16 games were decided by one score last season. Wins and media coverage are great, but this team is currently ranked way too high amidst a very deep group of teams in 2017. To prove my point, let's look at the Lions' final four games of the season here. Week 15, an 11-point loss at the Giants where offense was abysmal. Week 16, a 21-point loss in Dallas. Week 17, the Lions score a last-second touchdown to make a 31-24 loss at home against Green Bay. Seemed much closer than the game actually was in the division championship game. Then the team gets absolutely embarrassed by the Seahawks in the playoffs, a team that was in a way reeling at the time. So when this team really had a chance to prove their worth against top shelf teams, they came up more than short week and week again, and I think we're in for more of that in 2017. And Lions fans will bring up the Stafford injury that surely didn't help, but he didn't look so much worse after he injured his hand that you could justify them losing consistently by 14 to 20 points. And if you still think I'm crazy, well, you're going to have to tell that to Vegas, who is also incredibly low on this Lions team, as I show the odds here for the Super Bowl. Matthew Stafford really impressed me last year. He has developed his game far better than I ever anticipated, and he is only 29, just two years older than Andrew Luck. He may continue to grow into a truly elite quarterback, but when I look at the overall talent and depth of this football team, I don't see how they can hold up like they did for as long as they did in 16. Then you pair the arrival of a significant injury to left tackle Taylor Decker and a tremulously difficult start scheduling-wise. This team is in for a rude awakening in 2017. Just for fun, let's look at that schedule here real quick. Week 1, Cardinals. Tough game. Should be close. Then at Giants, Falcons, at Vikings, Panthers, at Saints, Steelers, then at Green Bay. Without Taylor Decker, this team could realistically be looking at a 1-7 and seven or 2-6 and six start with that schedule. And I don't think this team will have the talent to bounce back from that type of a start. All that said, this team isn't fully hopeless. They do rank among a slew of teams that still have a shot at making the playoffs, which was started by the Bills last episode. But I do think that they will need an impeccable run of good luck with injuries. They'll need continued improvement from Matthew Stafford and amazing discipline from a defense that will be physically outmatched almost every Sunday. Now, Vegas has this team's over under at eight, and this is the first bet here that I am actually going to be taking. There are usually three or four over unders each season that catch my eye, and the Lions fit the profile of a team that will digress a ton in 2017, so give me the under. In fact, I've already taken this bet. So now, moving on to this depth chart, and just a reminder, I'm showing you my 2017 real roster available on Xbox One. All ratings have been changed to reflect how I feel about each player, and if I mention a player not shown, it is because Madden's interface makes it impossible to get every single player in there correctly. So at quarterback, we have Stafford, who I mentioned already that he impressed me a ton last year. I think the early retirement of Calvin Johnson was actually the best thing that could have happened to Stafford. His leadership has grown as the new face of this offense, and we saw him extend plays like he never did before, knowing he couldn't just locate Calvin and huck it up to him. Stafford actually happens to be a player I agree with EA on, as we both have him as the ninth best quarterback in football and an 85 overall. The only difference is I rank Stafford ahead of Derek Carr and below Phillip Rivers, whereas EA has them flipped. Stafford does have his flaws. He will still miss some throws and take chances he probably shouldn't, but he improved in both of those areas a ton last season to the point where it's not really a huge concern for me anymore as it was heading into 2016. 
Behind Stafford, they have Jake Rudock, who I was never a huge fan of at uh, Iowa or Michigan, and they draft Brad Kaya from Miami. Kaya was inconsistent but does have all the tools and a very pretty throwing motion, if I do say. If he can become a more consistent thrower, he could develop into a very good backup for Stafford. At running back, Amir Abdullah comes back from injury and will try to put together a healthy season. With an improved offensive line, I think we see some decent production from Abdullah, but I'm not expecting a ton as this is a pass-first offense. I think he gets close to 1,000 rushing yards but doesn't quite reach there, maybe about 850 on 250 carries. And they still do have Theo Riddick there, who is, in my opinion, the best third down back in football. That's not including do-it-all guys like David Johnson, Le'Veon, and and Shady. But uh, Theo Riddick's shiftiness after the catch is almost unparalleled, and he is a perfect fit for this offense who ran seemingly more quick screens, picks, and slants than any team in football. By the way, NFL, can we find a way to get rid of the pick play? It really just isn't real football to me. So it's really going to be a combination of those those two. I do like Amir Abdul if he can stay healthy. He doesn't have a ton of power, but good between the tackles ability, probably better than Theo Riddick. Zach Zenner should make the team. He's a solid power back, a good guy to have on the roster. Dwayne Washington, more of a raw prospect, opposite of a guy like Zach Zenner. Uh, should be a whole lot of Abdullah and Riddick, though, with maybe some Zenner mixed in or even Matt Asiata on the goal line who the Lions now have listed at fullback. They also have journeyman Mike James there fighting for a spot on this roster, maybe as a returner. At wide receiver, Golden Tate, a stud in the slot, has his weaknesses trying to play outside, but a very tough guy to get your hands on and bring down after the catch. Marvin Jones, who has cemented himself as the ideal wide receiver too, not just for the Lions, but has built a standard for the rest of the league, really. Kenny Galladay, possibly my favorite skill position player in this draft, was looking like he might go fifth or sixth round. The Lions take him in the third. I said months before the draft that he will be a better receiver than Mike Williams, who was drafted sixth overall. I will stand by that. This guy is more athletic than Williams. He has the small school pedigree, so he's a guy who knows how to work and face adversity. So if Golden Tate is the slot guy and Marvin Jones is the traditional number two, then does Kenny Galladay develop into this team's number one target? He definitely has the physical ability to do it, and I would not be surprised if all if he emerges as the number one receiver on this team, maybe not this year, but in the future. Behind those three receivers, though, it does get pretty thin. It will likely be Jared Aberderis, TJ Jones, Keyshawn Martin, and Jace Billingsley. Unless any of the three undrafted guys make an impact here, perhaps Dantes Ford out of Pitt is a guy to keep your eye on. Tight end is a solid group. Eric Ebron still pretty raw, honestly. Not the smartest, most consistent player, but still very young. And tight end is a tough position to learn. Could he finally break out in 17 like we've seen from third-year tight ends in the past? He's a scary guy with the ball in his hands for sure. Darren Wells comes in to plug in as the tight end two and a red zone threat. They draft Michael Roberts out of Toledo in the fourth round, a player I really like with awesome hands and some athletic upside. Kari Lee and Cole Wick to compete likely there for the fourth spot. At the offensive line, I talked about the injury to Taylor Decker earlier. It's going to hurt. Stafford has a decent sense in the pocket, but we've seen him really struggle in that area in the past, and I'm afraid now with... Greg Robinson and Cyrus Quanjo filling in there that it will become a serious liability. Both of those two guys were high profile athletes and high draft picks who were horrendous disappointments in pass protection. Now coming over to Detroit, Corey Robinson also at left tackle will compete. Seventh round pick from two years ago. Left guard also a liability. Neither Tomlinson or Glasgow have shown too much as they've kind of rotated between guard and tackle. Center is solid with Travis Swanson, backed up by probably going to be uh, Lake and Tomlinson. And then the right side of this line will be a strength with the additions of TJ Lang and Ricky Wagner, with Joe Dahl and Cornelius, Cornelius Lucas to be the backups there. Overall, it's not a great offense. Last season, it was very much one dimensional, yet highly effective 
in the quick passing game, but does the addition of some uh, tools in the running game and the continuous growth of Matthew Stafford allow Jim Bob Cooter to open up this offense a little more? Uh, perhaps, maybe even likely, but maybe not until Decker can return on the left side of the line will this group be in full force. On the other side of the ball, this is a group that played okay last season, but overall lacks consistent talent. The D-line is very much average. It looks like they'll be asking Cornelius Washington to start coming over from Chicago. That's not ideal. And Kerry Hyder, who was a sack machine last year, but also a bit of a one-trick pony, will likely now be splitting reps with him on the left side. Ezekiel Ansa had a bit of a down year. Madden really shredded his rating, moving him down to like a 77, I believe. But he should still be solid, one of the better edge players in football. Then you've got Brandon Copeland, Armani Bryant, Anthony Zatel. They'll all take turns on the oxygen mask. And you move inside. Haloti Nada returns as the force there, still playing at a high level. Ashawn Robinson, rookie from last year, had a decent year as a rookie. He will start. Akeem Spence, signed from Tampa, should get in on pass rushing situations to relieve Robinson and Nada, who are more run stuffers at this point. I'm extremely intrigued by Jeremiah Ledbetter. He's a super athlete who has the upside to develop into a high-profile lineman. Physically reminds me some of Ethan Westbrook with the Rams, who has all the tools, but might Ledbetter be able to put things together a little better than Westbrook? He's a sixth-round rookie, definitely someone to keep an eye on there. Then they have an abundance of journeymen behind those guys who will compete for roster spots. Guys like Kyrie Thornton, Bruce Gaston, Jordan Hill, and Ego Ferguson. I would say two of those guys probably make it. At the second level, this linebacking group is frankly one of the worst in football. Levy leaves. Didn't play a ton last year anyway, but who fills his absence? Left to right, it looks like it will be Paul Warlow, who got flushed out of Atlanta, rookie Gerard Davis, and Tahir Whitehead. I like Davis's upside, but he has a lot to learn. Tahir Whitehead is fine, but not fine when he's your best guy in the group, and I don't expect a whole lot from Paul Warlow. The depth is pretty poor as well. They do have Jalen Reeves Mabin. How well does he develop as a high-profile athlete? Fourth-round pick out of Tennessee. Thurston Armbreister, Nick Ballore, Antoine Williams. I don't see anyone emerging from that group. And then wrapping it up in the secondary, Darius Slay is an absolute monster. In my opinion, a top-five corner who plays at a ridiculously high level without the help of a solid pass rush, unlike most of the corners considered elite, excluding maybe Josh Norman. I think... NFL Network should be embarrassed not having Slay in the top 100. After Slay, however, this group is going to need someone else to step up. Nevin Lawson and Quandre Diggs were the second and third best corners here last year. They're tough players out there, but are both undersized at 5'9". So they bring in DJ Hayden and draft Tease Tabor, who I am a huge believer in. Tease is not an exceptional 40 guy, but... Really impressive film, just a playmaker, really quick breaks on routes. One of these two is going to have to really step up if this group wants to compete for the playoffs. And behind that group, you have Johnson Batamosi, who might be the odd man out here with young talent in Adaris Barnes and Alex Carter there as well. At safety, Glover Quinn is just a professional and elite safety in my mind. He sadly doesn't get EA's support coming in at like a 83 in their roster. Tavon Wilson, okay player at strong safety, could probably be upgraded, however. Don Carey, an eight-year veteran and youngster, Miles Killebrew, a fourth-round pick from last year looking to develop. So to wrap it all up, this defense is just okay in my mind. It's a group that plays fast and smart, but doesn't necessarily have the top talent outside of Slay, Quinn, and Ansa. While those are three very good pieces, I expect this defense to have its ups and downs, to say the least, and it will probably finish somewhere around the 20th best defense in football. That paired with roughly a top 12 offense, maybe by the end of the year, and this team is by no means terrible, but I talked about the schedule. Can they survive that first half and then maybe sneak into the playoffs similar to the last season? My money is on no, but again, they are just one of many teams who are on that border, so I guess we will just have to wait and see. Football a little over a month away, by the way, folks. I am so pumped.
So that does it, guys. I'm cutting the fantasy section out of these videos for now until I can come up with a better format for it. Plus, you guys are smart, so I'll let you take what I've said thus far and apply it to fantasy if you really liked that portion and want it back in. Speak up, but from what I gathered, you guys are more interested in all the stuff I just covered. And a couple plugs before I take off. We're going to be running another big Madden Ultimate Team giveaway this week, so follow me on Twitter for that. Be ready on Wednesday. Follow me on Twitch as well for live streams, including live matchups from my 16-man franchise series. So that's going to do it, everyone. Lions fans, let me know your thoughts. I know you're probably not going to be happy about this, but if you agree, let me know. If you disagree, tell me why. What, what am I wrong about? I would love to hear from you guys. So thanks for watching, everyone. Peace out. Peace out.